Stories stir the soul. Stories reveal. And stories heal. In this podcast, we will give you an inside look at someone who's had a life-changing breakthrough. Real people, real stories with real breakthroughs. As a health and wellness expert and coach and Todd as a men's mentor, we've seen firsthand what God can do when it comes to a breakthrough. So lean in, listen well, this could be your biggest breakthrough. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Your Biggest Breakthrough. I'm Wendy Pett. I'm Todd Isburner. Hi, Todd Isburner. How are you today? <laughs> I'm fine, Wendy. Good. I'm fine. Let's get to it. Okay, let's get to it. All right. I want to know, do yeah. you think that you are resilient? Well, that that's an interesting question, uh, and I know it's a lead into our show today, but I think uh, it kind of depends on what what your definition of resilience is. I mean, I think I have mine, but what what do you mean? Well, it's not my definition, but it uh, is the definition, and it's the capacity to, um, oh, <laughs> are you going to make this up? Are you, know, you going to read, read the I'm reading it, uh-huh. but it didn't print off. That's hilarious. Uh, okay. So I'm not even going to be able to tell you the full definition, but it's basically to be able to recover quickly <laughs> from difficulties. That's hilarious. And that says resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting, which I was just doing, right? Did you yeah, you were that? very nice. Resilient with all yes, this, very good to difficult or challenging life experiences especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility and adjustment to oh, external oh, and internal I'm demands. Definitely, you, definitely resilient. You're resilient. Yes, However, you I want, I want you to know that, yeah. um, in this interview today, mm. uh, I learned some things about resilience that I did not know. We and it is, did. it is better equipped me so that when I face my next big challenge, I will be, I think ahead of the game, much better, yeah. and, you know, much more able to get through it because of what I learned today. Yeah. And one of the things that we learned was that significant things in life take time. Yeah. You, the old patience thing. I know. Well, why, why are you it's like, it's true. No, because it's so, yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah. it's so, it's so true. true. I just don't like that because I'm so impatient. <laughs> That's it. Or uh, something else that I learned. It's in, it's the importance of asking for the right kind of help mm. as you go through this, you need support. Uh, asking for help, Todd. How are you with that uh, no, one? It's another one that just drives me crazy. <laughs> and also knowing that whatever you're going through, that you, you want to know that your the love for what you're the breakthrough, basically. The love is is so much bigger and it pales in comparison to the pain you're going through, mm-hmm. right? The love of, of the outcome uh, and seeing that you're worth it and seeing that it's it's all going to be good. Yeah. Right along with that. I mean, you really do have to adjust your focus and and our guest is going to teach us how to do that so that we really can believe there's a payoff uh, at the end of all this. Yes. And he knows all too well, his name is Mark Black and he is the only man in history to have run a marathon. Let's check this out with someone else's heart and lungs. Yes, you heard that correctly. He was born with a life-threatening heart defect and Mark survived two dangerous open heart surgeries before the age of one. Mm. 21 years later, after waiting on the transplant list for nearly a year, Mark was blessed to survive a perilous heart and double lung transplant. And then check this out. Oh my goodness. It just gets better. Three years later, he ran his first marathon, full marathon. Then he did it. What? Oh yeah. Three more times. <laughs> well, he's because he's resilient <laughs> right? and a re, he actually is, he's a resilience expert. He's a speaker. He's a coach. He's an author and he helps people break through their limitations and transform their adversity into their competitive advantage. He's a certified speaking professional. He's inspired more than 200,000 people at more than 600 organizations, uh, including Exxon Mobil and Mercedes Benz. And Mark lives in Moncton, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Moncton, Moncton? New Brunswick, Canada, with his wife, Maurice. A? And they're, A? Oh, I don't know if they say that there. That. But no, what? He's Canadian. Every Canadian gets so tired of A? <laughs> his wife, Maurice, and their three children, Emma, Mateo, and Caleb. Uh, enjoy the show. Well, welcome to your biggest breakthrough, Mark Black. We are just honored to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, we could go one of two ways because if anybody reads your bio, 
I think a lot of people are going to be fascinated. Well, by they what just you, heard it. But that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> but, but they read it on their own too. But if they really wanted to go somewhere, I have a feeling a lot of people first off want to go like, how the heck did you run marathons after what you went through? Because you, uh, you did, you ran three marathons. We're going to get into your story, of course, but just talk a little bit about, about why you decided to go ahead and run a marathon. In fact, three marathons. And then I think you even, you even ended up getting some, uh, some awards some trophies, some in competitions? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I run uh, four marathons, a handful of half marathons, uh, and then I had the opportunity to compete uh, at the both Canadian and World Transplant Games, which are essentially like uh, the Olympics for people that have had transplants. Okay. It's the, only, the, only, the only sports competition in the world where you're, uh, you're eliminated if you don't test positive for steroids because we're all on steroids for our immunosuppression so oh right uh, that's that's always the joke it's like if you test negative for steroids you're kicked out oh that's hilarious um, <laughs> yeah we've never run into a transplant uh contestant before no <laughs> so that and the fact kind of glossed over quickly so yeah. that's what we want to get into and the fact that you ran your first marathon after just three months of having your heart transplant and double lung transplant. Three, well, two and a half right? years, not, not three months. I want to, I oh. want to, don't want to take too much credit. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. about to say, what? I thought I read that somewhere and I'm like, that's, yeah, two, that's two, insane. Two, under, under three years, two and a half. Okay, two and three and half. years. Thank yeah. you for clarifying. Yeah. Whew. yeah. I thought you were Superman. <laughs> you, you still kind of are. Well, your, your story is one of resiliency. That's a word that is associated with your name and with your experience in life, Mark. So let's take our listeners back to the beginning of what you encountered at a very early age, and then just walk us through the journey of what you experienced and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So we'll we'll start at the beginning. And if you're listening, don't worry, we're not going to go through 40 years of history here. But <laughs> okay. uh, but I was the firstborn of two young parents. They were uh, 24 years old, my parents were when I was born. Uh, and I mentioned that because I'm a parent myself now and I can only really imagine uh, what it must have been like because, you know, the nerves of uh, uh, of parenthood are, are always intense when a new child is being born, but especially your first. And I was born and turned blue. Mm. Uh, no insight ahead of time that this was going to happen, but uh, very quickly doctors realized I had a, a pretty serious heart defect and I was rushed away to the local children's hospital where I had an open heart surgery at one day old. Mm. Um, and then another one when I was a year old and then grew up with, with chronic health challenges with, with congestive uh, heart failure, <laughs> with congenital heart disease. And um, so a, a, a pretty challenging uh, childhood. And what's interesting is that like the, your mom had a completely perfectly normal, healthy pregnancy. So there was no indication this was coming. Yeah. So just yeah. as you mentioned at the front end here, what it must be like for a parent to experience that right when their child is born and a day and the next day have to go into open heart surgery. Is that what you said? Yeah, I was, I was actually medevaced by helicopter because the children's, the, the specialty children's hospital was uh, about a three hour drive. So it was, uh, taken by uh, ambulance helicopter, and you know, the, mom and dad had to stay in hospital. Mom was recovering, so they actually didn't even get to come with me. Wow. Uh, they met me uh, in Halifax, where the surgery happened a couple of days later. So, um, yeah, no, and I again, it kind of boggles my mind as a parent of three what that must have what that must have been like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine just that stress that your parents were going through, and, mm. and your mom's trying to recover from just giving birth and and the yeah. stress of all of that. And so, um, okay, so you had your first surgery uh, then. And so obviously the, the surgery uh, took and it was successful, but you had um, some struggles throughout your, your years. And can we just kind of dive into what those struggles look like? How did you live your life? Um, did you get bullied? Like, I'm just curious about all of that. Sure, yeah. Um, so I had a second surgery when I was a year old, and then the doctor said, look, he'll probably need more before he starts school. Um, he's going to have a, a, you know, a list of, of challenges to face through, through his life, and there are really no guarantees. Um, and I was very fortunate that after the second surgery, most things went fairly smoothly. I mean, I was on uh, various medications uh, on and off through my childhood. Um, I was always the smallest kid in class. 
Uh, I have three. I joke. I have three younger brothers, not three little brothers. Uh, my brothers <laughs> are all uh, six feet or taller, and I am four feet eleven. So um, yeah. yeah. So uh, so I was always the smallest kid in class. But my mom and dad were uh, career long uh, physical education teachers, and so their priority or one of their priorities for us was to be as physically active as we could be. And so while they consulted with the medical teams, they said, look, how how physically active can he be? And to their great credit, they made a, a kind of fundamental decision very early on with the advice of some veteran nurses uh, to treat me much like they would treat any other child. And so even though there were regular appointments with pediatricians and cardiologists, other than that, my childhood was quite normal. At least it was normalized so that I felt like it was normal. I mean, I didn't have uh, anything to compare it to, I suppose. Uh, but but you had this I awareness sports and, as a child. You had this awareness that there was a heart condition and that that that's the part of life that wasn't normal. Right. And yet everything around you was functioning normal. So you wanted to function normal. But were there times, uh, you know, deep within yourself that you had... Uh, fears about what might happen or uh, or other kinds of struggles that you just like you couldn't figure it out or did it just not really affect you oh no certainly uh, there were many many times along the way where whether it was after a doctor's appointment and they'd found a new issue or something had gotten worse or, or whatever the case might be where you know, I, I, I struggled and I was angry and I, you know, it's not fair. And all of those, all, I think all of the fairly normal uh, human emotions that we feel when we face challenges. Uh, and, you know, like when I was 13, I had been very physically active. I was a competitive athlete despite my size for a long time. What was your sport of choice? Uh, soccer and, and ironically basketball. Oh, <laughs> really? Uh, right? Hey, yeah. hey, I think yeah. a spud web. That's Come great. on now. That's it's awesome. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was able to keep up until everybody kind of hit their growth spurt in kind of fifth or sixth grade and I didn't. But um, and and then at, at 13 or 14, doctors said, look, it's his condition is getting worse. It's becoming more risky for him to be playing at a high level and really pushing his body that hard mm -hmm. and he needs to stop and so that was that was a major kind of turning point in my life because you know i think i had formed an identity around being an athlete right sure. that was that was who i was in my mind anyway um and so i felt kind of lost for a little while during that period because i thought well now what do i do especially at that age right that's a tough age uh, yeah. anyway yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly and and again my my parents have always been very good at helping us to be you know optimistic um finding the good and bad situations figuring out what we can control and what we can't and and where we can what we can do about a situation instead of just kind of playing victim to circumstance. And they said, okay, well, you can't do this. What can you do? Yeah. Right? Okay. So what that's, other things can you do? That's mm. good. So that um, gives me hope to know that actually we can learn resiliency because we may not always be wired that way. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so let's talk about that because your, your parents uh, helped program you, if you will, mm. to mm -hmm. become more resilient. And mm -hmm. so um, let's talk a little bit more about how that looked. How did they how did they encourage you to be positive and think uh, of, of the good and not the bad? And what was the, what were their strategies, I guess, and, and the ways in which they um, taught you boys? Yeah. I mean, I think a few key, a few key things. First of all, I think they, they allowed us, you know, within reason and safety to make mistakes uh, and to, and to suffer the consequences, good or bad of those mistakes and learn from them. Um, you know, they, they allowed, and, and again, as a parent today, I, I have a greater appreciation for how hard it must have been because as a kid, I just like, well, this is normal. Um, <laughs> but, but to allow a kid with a chronic heart condition to be, you know, sprinting up and down a quarter of a field and watch him wipe out and watch him fall and watch him get bumped by bigger kids and, um, and, and allow me to, to do that is is not a foregone conclusion. It's certainly not in today's culture uh, where we want to kind of bubble wrap our kids. Uh, and they allowed me to do that and allowed me to figure out alternative 
solutions and how would I, you know, when I'm a half foot or a foot shorter than the other kids in the court, how am I going to figure out a way to, to compensate for what I don't have with other things, whether it's a better skills or mental toughness or whatever it was to, to overcome that. Um, you know, and then when we navigated the, the change from not being able to play sports anymore, well, so what other skills do you have and where might you find an outlet for those? And it turned out that that theater became a thing, which ironically now I'm a professional speaker and and I don't know that I ever would have discovered, right. I know, I don't know that I ever would have discovered theater if I hadn't been forced to find it, right. Um, And those those skills obviously serve me very well today, probably much better than being able to dribble a basketball would have. So your parents are (sighs) They are resilient. They started that resiliency uh, legacy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Such great yeah. models. And like you said, today's kids are so bubble wrapped, if you will. It's a great term to use, just the the overprotectiveness that parents show. Why that is, I don't really know. I, but I grew up having to face tough times as well as many in my generation. And it's just great that your parents didn't, you know, didn't coddle. look at your condition mm-hmm. as something where you needed to be, yeah, you just kind of coddled and babied, but just let's let's go for it and provide you other uh, options and solutions. Um, let's, uh, let's go up towards now what happened, uh, at a little later age and what was threatening in terms of your condition and where things were at. Right. So I, I graduated from school, from high school on time against the odds. I went to, got an undergraduate degree in, in English literature and sociology, and then was going to do an education degree. I was going to be a teacher like mom and dad. That was my plan. And through the first semester of that year, I started to just feel like symptoms were getting worse. I was shorter breath more often. Uh, uh, Exertion became more difficult. I was tired more often. I was eating less. But I was also a 23-year-old male, so I was young and stubborn and invincible, and I just ignored a multitude of symptoms for far too long because I thought maybe they'll fix themselves, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, I came home at the end of that school year, and mom took one look at me and said, you you look horrible. I'm taking you to the doctor right now. And the long story short is I had, I had lost about 20 pounds and on a 411 frame, that's significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, And my doctors ran a battery of tests. I was in the hospital for about a month, but they said, "Uh, you're now in, in right and left sided congestive heart failure and your pulmonary artery pressure. So the arterial pressure that brings blood between the lungs and the heart is very high. And we'd known for a long time that heart transplant was was a possibility someday, like far down the road. And now they said, look, it, it, you need to transplant like yesterday. Um, we are out of other medical options for you. Uh, it, there are no other interventions to do. There's no other medications to give you. You, you need a, a new heart and two new lungs and you need them now. And uh, unfortunately, because of a shortage of organ donors, while you need this transplant, the chances that you're going to get it are virtually zero. Uh, There are not enough donors. You need three organs, not one. You're small, so finding a suitable donor that fits your body is going to be very challenging. And the closest transplant center is in Toronto, which is a 14-hour drive. Uh, So So it wasn't just the heart that you needed. It was a double lung transplant as well. So I was making that clear as far as the three organs yeah yeah Yeah, exactly and and it all has to come from the same donor so um my my i remember the doctor in halifax who the cardiologist who had been you know had been seeing me for years essentially said you have two options uh option one is we can try to get you on a transplant list but quite honestly i don't think that's going to happen uh option number two is you go back home and we try and keep you comfortable uh and functioning for as long as we can And, and you know you're 23 years old it took me about 10 seconds to say, you do whatever you need to do. I'm not going home to die. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get me on a list. And I was, I, again, just just really, really, really blessed that uh, they they took me. Uh, the team in Toronto, we had a couple of cho- choices of centers to go to. We chose Toronto uh, really for two reasons. One, they had done the first successful lung transplant in the world. So they'd mm-hmm. been doing this longer than anybody else. And I always say, call me nuts, but I'm going to go to the place where they've done this once or twice before. Yeah. And, uh, and we had family in Toronto and, and they, the, you know, we were told lungs are particularly fragile organs. Obviously all organs are fragile, but uh, the lungs at that 
point had a lifespan between donor and recipient of about six hours. Oh, wow. Wow. So you're not going to wait and catch a commercial flight when a donor has been found. There's just not enough time. So to be put on the list, a requirement was you live within a two hour radius of the transplant center. So we had to move to be put on the list. Mm. And we had family in Toronto. So uh, who were incredibly gracious and said, you know, move in with us, just, mm. just come and stay. Mm. So, um, long story short, my dad and I packed our bags and we left my mom and my three younger brothers home to try and normalize their life as much as possible. And dad and I moved to Toronto to start waiting for this transplant. Wow. 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 And, and so you're mm. waiting, you're waiting and you're waiting. Uh, let's and talk listen, about how wait, long the wait. While yeah? you're waiting, I just have to ask Mark, I mean, were you thinking thoughts like I could die at any afraid, time or this may not come through? How were you processing those thoughts? Yeah, I was, in, uh, yeah, I was very afraid. I mean, the, so the first three or four months, um, we waited out, out of the hospital. I waited, uh, my dad's uh, cousin who took us in, we, we stayed at his house and I would go to the hospital kind of twice a week to be checked out, you know, do various tests, but we were just kind of biding our time waiting. Um, they gave me a, a, a beeper and cause before everybody had a cell phone right. and they said, when this beeps, come in and have your surgery. So we're just waiting for this thing to beep. And after about four months, they, they had run another test or one of the regular tests and had found another abnormality, a rhythm abnormality that I had developed called ventricular tachycardia, which simply means your, your ventricles, the bottom two chambers of the heart spontaneously race out of control. And I, I couldn't, I didn't really feel symptoms of that, but they explained to me that it was happening fairly regularly and that that left me at high risk for sudden cardiac death, which means your heart just stops. So they said, look, it's not medically responsible for us to leave you waiting for this transplant outside of the hospital anymore. Because if this happens, by the time someone finds you on the ground with your heart stopped and tries CPR, your odds of survival are minimal. But if we can keep you on a heart monitor in the hospital, we'll know the second it happens, we'll have a trained team there. We have the defibrillators, the equipment we need, and we can hopefully shock the heart, reset the rhythm and, and keep you going. So we need you to move into the hospital. So the last, I waited on the transplant list for 10 months, but the last six months I was, I was in a hospital room. Wow. Wow. Oh, six months man. in a hospital room. So okay. how were you in that in that state of being in a hospital room at 23 years old. And I mean, were you, were you feeling discouraged, encouraged? Were you depressed? Were you kind of, where were you in that, in that uh, season? Right. I mean, I know that there was fear there, but mm -hmm. just, I don't know. I'm just trying to picture myself. My son's 23, right? So I'm trying to picture, you know, the 23 year old you and that has tons of energy and ready to go, just kind of, you know, in prison, if you will, yeah. kind of in a hospital. Yeah. So how, how were you and what, what was your faith like at that time? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so yeah, that's a really good analogy. I often say I have never been to prison, but I feel like that's what it was like. Um, and I, you know, I often joke as a, someone who's kind of called a motivational speaker that I'm, who was supposed to be positive all the time. Uh, that I failed the test because for the first month, essentially, um, it was just a big, you know, pity party for me. Why this isn't fair? Why me? All of that stuff. Um, and certainly my faith was, it was there, but it was also um, rocky and challenging, right? God, I, like I've been through enough here. Why, why do I have to deal with this? Um, and when are you going to step in here? Like, well, what are we waiting for? Yeah. And it was my mom, mom and dad uh, switched places between home and Toronto uh, a few different times through that period. They were, we were really fortunate. Their employer uh, said, look, you have very similar qualifications, share one job and just come and go as you want. As long as somebody's there to do the work, um, we don't really care which one of you it is. And so they would, they would, you know, trade off with each other. And my mom is, is the one of the two of my parents who is the, uh, teller of unvarnished truths. <laughs> so what a great way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, one more time. The teller yeah. of unvarnished truths. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She will not put up with my baloney in other words. So, so, good. so she came in one day and she'd had enough 
uh, she had let me vent for a while, but she'd had enough. And she said, look, you have to make a decision. Choose to feel the way you're feeling if you want to. I empathize. But how is it working? Mm. And where will you be in a month or two or three if you keep thinking how you're thinking and feeling how you're feeling? So you do whatever you need to do for as long as you need to do it. But if I were you, I'd be focusing on what's going right instead of what's going wrong. I'd be focused on what I control instead of what I don't. I'd be focused on what I am grateful for instead of what I've lost. You've got a wise mama. Yeah. Now I'm 23 years old. So my response is whatever. You like, you don't get <laughs> whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I always joke that, and it's true. I said it took about a month for her advice to sink in or more accurately for me to decide it was my idea. And then it was a good one. Um, <laughs> right. But, but you're right. She was getting so wise, right. Yeah. So much of our lives lie outside of our control and in less than until we're able to accept those parts, we become ineffective at the things that we can control because we're wasting time and energy trying to fix the things or be angry at the things or whatever it is, uh, trying to, to, to control the uncontrollable. It's so good. And so, so once I, I was, and it wasn't a switch that I flipped, obviously it's a practice that you fail at a lot and you get a little bit better at it over time. Um, but I began to try and let go. And, and really what that looked like is I was, like I would track everything, for example. So I would go to the, every morning, I would go to one part of my morning routine would be to go to the nurse's station and ask them how many times my heart had done this funny rhythm the night before. Oh, yesterday it was two times and today it was four. And what does that mean? And oh, now it's three and the next day it's six. And so like somehow that was going to prevent it from happening the next day. It was, it was ridiculous, but in my mind, it was a way to try and control this thing that I couldn't control. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at some point I just had to go, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I'm in the best place I can be. We're taking all the precautions we can take. There's nothing else I can do. Right. And, and once I, I kind of began to let go of that, obviously the, the stress level lowers significantly um, because I'm not trying to fix it anymore. And that gave me time and the mental space to focus on other things and notice, well, Hey, like this is really hard, but I, I, I won the birth lottery of being born in a place where at least there's a chance that I survive yeah. because there are many places around the world where doctors would have said, yeah, we've read about this thing called heart lung transplant, but we don't have the technology or we don't have the surgeons or we don't have the, the wherewithal to do it. So at least there was a shot. Uh, I didn't go a single day in the six months I was in that hospital by myself mm. because mom or dad or a friend or my brothers were making sacrifices in their personal lives to make sure somebody was there to make me laugh and keep me company and, and, and help me through this incredibly challenging time. And there were lots of people next door, down the hall, in that same hospital, going through very challenging things themselves alone because for whatever reason their family couldn't be there or they didn't have family or whatever the case was. And so I started to look around and see all of these things to be grateful for in the midst of a very challenging situation. And it, it, it began to transform my experience of the same circumstances. So good. You know, <clears throat> it reminds me of, I was looking up uh, second Corinthians 12, nine and 10, and I'm just going to share this. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so what I'm hearing you say is that <clears throat> resiliency is about the letting go, the surrender. And that's, that's when you you feel in the, in the, the flesh, you know, weak, right. But yet that's when the strength comes in because, um, you let go of the control. And I just love how you represent all that that scripture is about. So, well, yeah, yeah thank you for that. And, and you're right. I think it's so in, in the book and in my programs, they talk about kind of two critical parts of the journey are acceptance and adaptation. And, and what I mean by that is absolutely, unless and until we accept what we can't fix, we will be com 
we will be less effective than we could be. I also think God gave us skills and abilities and intelligence and all of these things for a reason. And so it isn't, I joke with people, you can take acceptance too far, right? You can take acceptance to the point of just saying, well, nothing is in my control. I can't do anything. And so, you know, what was me? Life isn't fair. And I don't think that's good either, right? It's, it's the just, okay, it's the balance of saying, okay, I can't do these things, but what can I do? And, and then how do I change my mindset, my behavior, my actions to fit a, a new circumstance, not, not change my values and my principles, but how do I change the way that I, that I behave in this new context, mm-hmm. right? I, I can't be, you know, I went from being a full-time student with a, um, you know, a, a girlfriend of three years who I plan to marry, uh, a career all laid out in front. Like I had my life, I was one of those kids. I had my whole life planned. And then all of a sudden it's all gone. And and so now what am I gonna do? And it took a long time to figure out, okay, I need I need to create a new picture. I need to, to figure out some, you know, clearly that, that path, at least the way I envisioned it, is not gonna go that way. What am I gonna do? And 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 what what's gonna get me out of bed tomorrow morning and what am I working towards? You know what strikes me, Mark, is there there you are in the hospital for six months. <laughs> you had a lot of time on your hands. And it's like, when in the world is this uh, potential donor ever going to come through for me? What is there a chance? And there always was a chance, but it just kind of strikes me that the waiting period was an extremely valuable period for you because of the lessons you learned about surrender, about not having control, about all those things that you're living out today and then teaching others to do. So you're waiting. <clears throat> these revelations are beginning to happen. You're starting to surface. You're processing these things. And then what happened next? Obviously, so, the, the transplant came through. Tell us about that. So on September the 6th, 2002 at 10, 15 p.m. There you go. <laughs> Remember the day for the rest of my life. Uh, sitting in my room watching TV before bed and my nurse, one of the nurses, the amazing nurses that were there, Gail, came to the door and said, Mark, there's a call for you at the nurse's station. Now there's a bed beside, there's a phone beside my bed. I don't get calls at the nurse's station. So I know something is up. But I'm trying not to get too excited and I follow her down the hall into the nurse's station and I, I pick up a phone and a stranger's voice says, Mr. Black, I think we have a set of heart and lungs for you. Mm. And there's this long pause because as much as I'd had the time to prepare, I had no response ready. <laughs> Thank you, I think is what I managed. Um, Came back to the my room, called my mom. She was with me in Toronto at that point, said, you need to get to the hospital now. Uh, she came, we hugged, we cried, we we prayed together. In fact, we had a, an amazing uh, Catholic nun who came and spent a couple of hours with us in the time between knowing this would happen and the actual surgery. And her prayers and her presence and God's presence through her had this incredibly calming effect. Like... I say to this day, I, I don't remember a time in my life when I was more at peace than the half hour, hour before I went into surgery, wow. which wow. I anticipated being the most nerve wracking time of my life, right? You're about to go into surgery knowing you may never come out again. Like it should be incredibly right. tense and anxiety ridden. And it was the exact opposite. Right. I remember, <clears throat> so, so around 5 a.m. in the morning, the surgeons come to the door and say, okay, it's time to go. And I looked up on my mom and my mom looked at me and I mean, we'd had time to, to, to talk already, but I remember saying to my mom, mom, I'm going to see you soon. Mm-hmm. And uh, they wheeled me away and, and then that was it. I was in surgery for seven hours. So I, I remember very little of about the next week, frankly, because the, they keep nice. you very heavily, very heavily sedated for mm-hmm. the first four or five days so that you can heal. Um, but yeah, the, the, the surgery took about seven hours. I was in the ICU for five days. And then uh, in the hospital, a total of 16 days after the surgery. So they said, pre-transplant, the doctor said, you prepare yourself for about a three-month stay post-surgery. Uh, and I was out in 16 days. And, That's um, miraculous. And you're like, yeah. I'm busting out of here. We <laughs> got this job done and I'm out of here. That's so good. Well, you, you are a miracle. You really are. And um, I mean, our, all of our lives are a miracle. But 
but your life in particular and all that uh, God is doing in and through you is, is miraculous. I'm, I'm curious about one thing. Um, do you know anything about the donors? And you may get that question often, but I'm just curious. I do, yeah, no, fair. That's a great question. And, and a, a fair so question. One donor. Yeah. One donor. Um, and, and no, we didn't, we know, we know nothing for sure. Um, because it's a purposefully anonymous process so that the family and the donor and their identity are protected on purpose. Mm -hmm. We were given the opportunity to write a thank you letter to them that goes through the health authority and then on to the family and then if the family chooses to respond they can and so i wrote a letter mom and dad wrote a letter um very difficult letters to write um and then that the family in our case did not respond now what we we can guess with a fair degree of certainty is that based on my stature i probably got a child's organs uh and so again as a parent i can only imagine that um that the family, you know, was just in such a deep grieving period having. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, Mark, this might sound a little bit like a weird sure. question, but I'm just curious <laughs> because sure, all of our questions you, are a you know you, you have another person's mm -hmm. heart and lungs inside of you. Uh, did did you notice any other kind of uh, besides the physical changes? Any other kinds of reactions that you had, either mentally, emotionally, spiritually, even physically, once you received someone else's heart and lungs? Like he's a two in one. Yeah, there were, yeah, saying? yeah, there were a few, there were a few things. I mean, really? Um, so first of all, it's just a strange sensation. So, you know, for the, for the average person, for me today, um, we have a very steady, rhythmic, consistent heartbeat such that we don't notice it because it's, it's just the way we're, what we're used to. Mm -hmm. My heart that I was born with beat irregularly irregular in other words whenever the heck it felt like it mm. which to me was normal and so when i got this new heart and this strong rhythmic steady heartbeat it it echoed in my ear like i i had a hard time sleeping the first uh the first week or two because it was so such a foreign feeling um not a not a bad one but just a mm. very different, different. feeling yeah. um and so that that kind of echo <laughs> was in my ear regularly um so that that was something the other kind of strange thing was the first thing I wanted like to eat once I had the, I had a ventilator, uh, to help my lungs work for about the first five days. So I couldn't eat anything. But after that, the first thing I wanted was coffee and I had worked in a coffee shop. I had done five years of university, staying up late, doing papers and things. I had never once had a cup of coffee in my entire life. Interesting. Uh, that is wild. Yeah. <laughs> and the first, the first thing I wanted was coffee. Uh, and now I'm a bit of an addict. So, um, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. There's the doctors have theories about cellular memory and that all of our cells uh, carry bits of us. Um, and you know, so whether it's that or fascinating incidents, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. That is so fascinating. <clears throat> well, um, you know, I, I guess what I'm curious about now is, <clears throat> excuse me, after, you know, you get your new heart and lungs and, and you've gone through the healing process, all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I think I'll run a marathon. I mean, <laughs> here's the deal. Yeah, I mean, I'm, about? I'm in the health space and I have no desire to run a marathon. <laughs> like that's not even my thing, but you're like, yeah, this is a good idea. When did you decide that this is a good idea? I mean, you're the only man in history that has, has had a heart and lung transplant and ran a marathon four times. Yeah, it reminds me of somebody with a race car. <laughs> Let's see what this baby could do. <laughs> it was a little bit of that. It was a little bit yeah. of, of yeah. so I was actually, I was sitting in the ICU when I decided it was something I wanted to do. I was still in the ICU, uh, but I could feel this strong rhythmic steady heartbeat. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder what's possible now. Like, I wonder what's possible now that it wasn't possible last week. Maybe I could run again. When I was a kid, I did cross country running. I was not fast. Um, but, but I love to run. And in fact, I, the longer we ran, the better I would do because all the big kids could run fast. I could run long. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, well, geez, maybe I could do some distance running. And so that began, I mean, I couldn't, I, I jogged for one minute on the treadmill the last day of, there was a three month rehab program post transplant that I had to go to in the hospital. And then the last day I ran, I ran, I jogged on the treadmill for one minute, really just to prove to myself that I could do it. And it was painful and it was ugly, but I, but I, it showed me that it was possible. 
And then from there, I said, well, let's see if I can do a 5K and can I do a 10K? And so it took two and a half years. Um, and it's just, it's a very, it's like any big goal. It's just a very fulfilling thing to set your sights on something you're not sure you can do, work towards it and, and accomplish it. It felt, it felt pretty so cool. cool. So cool. I yeah. love that. And you, you over the, you know, the years that you were leading up to the transplants and then the years during that, or the months during that waiting time, and then following that, I mean, it just seems to me like you were in a continual training mindset process. You were training yourself how to let go of control. You're training yourself how to have gratitude, how to have a different perspective. Um, whether it's a physical situation like you went through or some other thing in life that is really challenging us, it seems to me that it's really easy to kind of form this mental bubble around us where we say, I shouldn't have to go through a tough time. <laughs> I expect life to be easy, not hard. Um, can, can you talk to those who are maybe stuck in that place and they need a breakthrough from a mindset standpoint? Absolutely. So one of my key sort of tenants or ideas is the question, what if it's supposed to be hard? Because mm. uh, I believe it is. Uh, and that it is life, it's work, it's business. If you run one, it's raising kids. It's if you, th and I often ask audience members that I, when I'm speaking, I'll say, I want you to think of something in your life that you are proud of. And if proud is a word that messes you up because you're Christian, then, then something that, that gives you a sense of satisfaction or a feeling like you've accomplished something significant and everybody can come up with something. Sometimes we struggle a little bit, to, but after a few minutes, people can come up with something. I say, okay, now was that thing easier? Or was it hard? And invariably it was mm -hmm. difficult. We're not, we're not proud of the things that were simple, right? But we can all look at something that we've been through in our life. That was a hurdle we had to overcome and we overcame it. And we, we probably learned something. We probably grew in some way. Uh, I also feel like uh, very rarely I am envious of the people who learn and grow in significant ways through, through smooth times. Mm. right i don't think it happens very often i think oh, most yeah. of the time yeah. we grow and we learn because we're forced to through adversity and discomfort mm -hmm. and so if we know that and we know that what's on the other side of that is probably something worthwhile then why why the resistance to things that are challenging i think we actually make hard things way harder mm. because we're trying to avoid them that's so true and i think of that song what doesn't kill us makes us stronger and, uh, and, and your proof of that as well. But I do, I think that people are soft, you know, nowadays they just don't want to do hard cause it's hard and it, it hurts. And, and we kind of put our own selves in that, that protective bubble. Like yeah. we don't, we don't want to do the work. Right. But that's where we grow and get better. So, um, there's probably someone listening that is dealing with their very own health diagnosis, uh, struggle or maybe a loved one's health diagnosis. And what would you say to them so that they would think and show up differently to help their situation? What would you say to them as your 23 year old self? And then as yourself now? Mm. Um, wow, that's a great question. So I think, uh, you know, patience is a virtue. Uh, I think one of the hardest things for all of us, especially in 2023, where we live with these things and we expect things to happen instantly. Um, the, the significant things take time and, and often that time is filled with challenge and adversity. Um, and we have to just kind of do our best to bear it and, and ask for strength and support to help us to do that. Um, and it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, that's good. Um, because, you know, I think we also live in an individualistic, self-made sort of world where we think we're supposed to be able to just figure it all out ourselves. And I certainly have not been able to do that, but support has been massively helpful. And I, I guess the key for me was I always had a fundamental belief, not a knowledge, but a belief that it would be worth it. Mm. So the problem isn't that things are hard. The problem is that, that when we think something is hard, that we have to go through isn't going to be worth the end result because yeah. we're all capable of doing really hard things anybody who's like the most universal experience i can think of is raising a children child right. but if that's not your experience then whatever it is we've all done hard things and and how do you do that you do that because the why behind what you're doing is big enough 
it matters enough to you that you find a way to do the how, right? So in the parenting example, we'll go without sleep and we'll change the horribly smelling diapers and we'll deal with them, you know, going through sickness and all of the and challenging our patients and all of that. And their smart mouth. <laughs> and largely, largely joyfully, although obviously there are periods of frustration and frustration, anxiety, et cetera. Why? Because our love is so big that those things all pale in comparison. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, or we hope that the adult we're raising is, is that that journey is worth it. Right? So how do you get through this transplant process? Well, you believe that life on the other side of the transplant is going to be worth it, that that you're, you know, and so if, if you're dealing with an illness, what can I learn from this so that I'm going to be a better human being? I'm going to learn, maybe I'm going to be more compassionate to others. Maybe I'm going to, whatever that, maybe I'm going to change my lifestyle habits so that I'm healthier afterwards because this was a wake-up call like what is that thing that's going to make this a worthwhile journey to experience because once you believe it's worth it you'll figure out a way to do it yeah, yeah. and so what if real quick what if that's the very place they're stuck they just don't believe it's going to be better on the other side yeah then you, you know have, what i mean like how do they level up on their faith yeah well that's 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 it i guess right you dive into you dive into prayer and scripture and and um whatever else works for you um, and that's the thing, like, I, I, I'm a big believer in experiment, figure, figure, figure it out. Um, because there isn't, I don't know that there's a prescription. I think it's really easy for us to just say, oh, well, here's the three steps. Mm -hmm. I mean, my book has, my book has seven steps, mm -hmm. but I, but I'm very careful to say, but you might jump from one to four to back to two to five to three, uh, yeah. cause, cause they're going to resonate differently with, with different people at different times. Um, so yeah, try things and, and. I guess the other big one for me has been do it if you if there's something you know you need to do don't wait to feel like doing it just do it mm. right exercise is a great example yeah yeah nobody I, I don't even people who are very physically fit and very active and regularly exercise have many many days where they don't feel like uh, yes indeed sure. right that's a great do illustration. It anyway yeah. yeah but i have yet to have a day where i was i was uh i regretted doing the exercise after right. Right. Never I always, happened. Say, yeah. I always yeah. say do it for the after effect, do it for yeah. the after results. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you has, you have so much wisdom that you've learned so much in life. And the beauty is that, uh, you've applied it and now you're teaching it to others. And one of the practical things that you just shared a few moments ago that I really like is when you're, when you're facing a situation where you're not quite sure, how am I going to get through this thing to just take a moment to think back on something tough in your life that you did get through. And you're really proud of it because like you said, there, there was a cost to that. It wasn't easy. It, required some pain and effort, but the outcome was so great. I think that exercise in itself mm -hmm. is a really important one to remember to do when you're in the middle of the next one. Uh, and you're wondering, how am I going to get through this? I, I also think too, just how in your whole physical experience of what you went through, all that, um, God is doing today in your life to kind of capitalize on what you've learned. So you now have a full-time speaking business. Uh, you're an author, you're a coach. I've checked out your website. Like I'm about ready to have a personal call for you to coach me because I love this stuff. <laughs> and yet he coaches too. So that's how good you are. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you have a new book called yeah. The Resilience Roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, like, I think like many of us have an experience where we find ourselves in a place in our lives that we didn't ever plan for because god has plans for us that we don't know about yeah. i had no inkling that this would be where i would be i gave a uh, a 10 minute speech at a graduate high school graduation ceremony about a year after my transplant and uh a gentleman came up to me um no doubt god planted him there uh but he came up to me and he tried to hire me to speak at his company he said can i have a business card and I was working at a call center at an insurance company. I didn't have a business card. I didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, I said, uh, "Sorry, I don't know. I don't have a card. What do, what, what do, what do you? What do you need?" And he said, "Well, that's that's what you do, right?" And I said, "What are you talking about? Well, like speak for people. Like that's what you." I said, "People do that. Like, what, what do you mean?" <laughs> said, yeah, we we bring people into my company. I think we pay them pretty well to do what you just did there. I said, oh, that's like, tell me more about that. That's, that's interesting. Uh, and so that man whose name I do not know, I have no idea huh. whose parent he was. Planted the seed. Yeah, planted the seed. And, and then, you know, 
spoke to a bunch of middle school kids and gymnasiums around town for, for a few months and then to high schools and then on to associations and companies and, and turned it into a full-time job. But um, yeah. yeah, but yeah. And, and so, you know, obviously as a business owner, you're trying to set goals and you're trying to plan and you do, you do your, your part, um, but it's absolutely just God writing through, through me, right? Uh, the, the, the number of times I've had a conversation with an audience member after a presentation and they said something to the effect of when you said X, Y, Z, it just, and I thought to myself, I know my speech inside out and backwards. And I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's no way those words come out of my mouth, wow. but you heard that, which means yeah. you heard what you needed to hear. Wonderful. Right. And that's when I kind of go, okay, like, this isn't, this isn't me. This is just right. This is just me sharing what I'm trying to share. And at some level it's connecting with other people. And yeah. that's pretty amazing. Well, you are, you are that's a good. gifted communicator and you're using those gifts in such a wonderful way uh, that God can now sort of expand uh, through a ripple effect, what you've experienced and what you've learned. And I checked out your Ted talk. I think it's about 16, 17 minutes long. And I just want to encourage everybody to go to the Ted, just, just Google Mark Black. And or, we'll put it in the show notes too. Yeah. And uh, check out that, uh, that Ted talk was absolutely brilliant. Yes. So thank you, my friend. You have so much wisdom to share. Thank you for taking time today. Uh, and uh, man, I've already taken a couple of notes of things I need to remember to do to stay resilient. Yes. Thank you, Mark. You are a joy. We appreciate you sharing your story and God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks right. so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. You know, we get the best people on our, our show. So Mark but is- But this is a first. This I mean, is definitely I, a first. An We've organ been, transplant. Not just one organ. I, well, but right. Yeah, double the, the whole set. And, I mean, the I never whole, knew that. You have to have a whole set. Right. I didn't, from, the, from the same from donor. From the same donor. I didn't know that you, either. You can see God's fingerprints all over that thing. Yeah. Uh, and how he's using Mark today to be mm. such an inspiration, such an to, encouragement to people who feel like, I just can't get through this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. But- uh, you know, here's a guy who got through it and you can learn from his experience. Yeah. And so make sure you go to markblack.ca. Uh, he is in Canada. So it's .ca, not .com. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. But check out again his new book called The Resilience Roadmap. And I think we could all, uh, you know, do better when we have a roadmap. Absolutely. Right? Cause guys yes. don't like no. to stop and no. ask for directions. No, you you, you need a roadmap. Right, what are the thing, oh, one okay. of the lessons that he see. taught us was that you can <laughs> stop thinking you've got control over everything. Right. Right. And Just uh, to boy, let he, go and he learned that we all learned that to some degree or another. And, uh, I think if, um, if you go check out his resources, you'll be very encouraged. You'll be motivated. You'll be yeah. instructed. You'll be strengthened. I could go on and on. So just check yes. it out. So, so good. And if you are a woman that's looking for uh, a health breakthrough in mind, body, spirit, emotions, check out my website at wendypet.com. Uh, I'm here to serve, here to assist you into getting into your next level of health and healing. And she's helped me. And uh, Aww, I want to encourage you I? to take advantage but of that. But I work help. with women mainly, but. You but you make an exception for me. <laughs> That's true. And don't call me a girl either. So <laughs> you can uh, be kind of girly. Though, <laughs> no, never. <laughs> not going to happen. Nope. And if you're a guy and uh, you want some extra help in, uh, in the area of your faith, uh, your family relationships, your fitness, your finances, uh, I'd love to be able to help you. In fact, if you go to my website, you can get a free copy of my book, just cover shipping and handling, and also join our group and get the uh, the course that accompanies the book. It's a real guide for you. It's toddisburner.com. Yes, cool. And if this show inspired and encouraged you, please share with others and give it a rating and a review. And so we appreciate you so very much. God bless, and we'll catch you next time. Head on over to yourbiggestbreakthrough.com where you'll find some free resources and information and a place where you can comment and we would love to dialogue with you there. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.